welcome everyone to the first panel discussion of our spring Moorhead Cane event season. We have curated an amazing lineup of talks and panel discussions for you this spring. So we hope you'll take a look on the MCN and learn more and RSVP. Uh, Sarah's gonna drop a link uh, for all of our events for the spring in the chat, so have a look. For today's panel discussion, we are delighted to present this all-star panel of climate champions who were all set to hold this event at the 2020 West Coast Moorhead Cane Alumni Symposium just about a year ago. We were all so disappointed that that event had to be canceled and we are equally thrilled that every single one of our original panelists was willing to be part of this virtual discussion. It's an honor for me to introduce your moderator for this discussion, Bill DeBuise, class of 1972. He's an incredibly accomplished conservationist and a talented and prolific writer. And Bill, we thank you for getting us started this evening. Well, thank you, Megan. Uh, by the way, I see uh, down below that we have 50 participants, which is exactly the number that you forecast. I don't know how you do this, but it's pretty impressive. Um, hello, everybody. It's really nice to see you, even if only uh, digitally. Uh, we were all going to meet in San Francisco at about this time last year, and uh, wouldn't you know, but world events intervened. So here we are um, using a technology that we've all gotten way more used to than we really want to be, but uh, thank goodness for it. Um, as we get started, I, besides just a warm welcome to everybody who's participating, I want to express some thanks for, to some of the people who've made this possible, particularly Steve Tobin, who has been tireless in organizing uh, these matters, and also to so many members of the staff of the Moorhead Kane Foundation, Megan Mazaki, Kim Robeson, uh, Emily Olson, Brendan, I wish I knew your name, but thank you for all that you're doing. Um, so with this great crew, we can carry on. Um, I want to offer just a few comments to sort of frame uh, our discussion uh, this evening. And uh, Tom O'Keefe will follow me with a little bit more uh, hard information uh, to help us get started. But let me just begin by saying that Climate change is really the defining issue of our time. Whatever any of us is doing, we probably need to do more. We're united in this understanding and we're also united in the difficulty of this work, our vulnerability to exhaustion and to doubt. The aim of this session is to focus on solutions that are being pursued at scale. I'd like to offer a metaphor. Our ship, planet Earth, is taking on water. It's not going to sink because we're not going to let it, but it's in trouble. Everybody needs to lend a hand at the pumps, but which pumps? Which are the most effective? Where are they and how do they operate? As anyone who has pumped a foundering boat can tell you, keeping up your spirits when it's hard to see improvement can be pretty dull and difficult. In addition to discussing how-to issues, we want to leave room for people's concerns of the heart and of self-care. This is a difficult, often discouraging arena. If people are interested, our panelists can also suggest techniques for pressing ahead when the going is tough. This job won't be finished soon. Endurance counts. Our aim is to describe an array of responses that would benefit from the participation of people on this call. The session is not about changing out light bulbs or buying an electric vehicle, but rather about working towards systems level change. We're gonna talk about multiple kinds and, and levels of involvement. The event is come as you are. One size will not fit all and one answer will not be adequate for the breadth of the problem that we faced. Each of us has a part to play. I'd like to remind everyone that there's no bottom limit to how bad climate change can get. That's why action now is so imperative. Also, there's good news. 
Clearly, the advent of the Biden administration is a game changer. The implications are myriad, and for many of us, it may mean that our individual efforts will now gain more traction. No less important, the scientific consensus appears to have shifted. It now seems that once global emissions are brought under control, the climate should stabilize relatively quickly, rather than in, in a time frame of generations, as was previously thought. This should inspire us all to press ahead even more hopefully and decisively. Now we wanna keep this conversation going beyond this evening. And so at the end of the call, Megan is gonna offer you some information about next steps. But let me now turn things over to Tom O'Keefe to provide a little more back, background. Tom. Um, one second. Sorry about this, uh, my Zoom just glitched out on me. All right, thanks Bill. And uh, thank you to the foundation staff and to everyone for being here this evening. Um, I'm honored to join this accomplished group of panelists and especially honored to have been nominated by them for the straightforward task of summarizing climate crisis in five minutes. Uh, the impacts of climate crisis, as I think you all know, are being disproportionately suffered by poor people, communities of color, and in the global south. Unsurprisingly, indigenous, black, and youth climate champions are often at the forefront of climate action globally, uh, especially given the problematic bases of the fortunes of our benefactors. I hope to attend in the future many MC climate events featuring more diverse and representative speakers. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so climate crisis is the culmination of 500 years of capitalist development rooted in slavery and genocide. Often focus is directed narrowly towards global heating and sea level rise, but climate change is only one of a number of planetary boundaries. Our current economic system threatens to rupture, just as there are a number of key human needs that this system leaves unmet. So uh, th this is why we must reject false solutions like geoengineering that fail to account for the complex interconnections of the challenges we face and rather work towards actual solutions, for example, a Green New Deal in the United States that center those most harmed by long histories of extraction and violence. Uh, next slide, please. By 1990, the science was largely settled on human caused global climate change, and yet 60% of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions have occurred in just the last 30 years. Uh, this, of course, has everything to do with the power of the fossil fuel industry and its climate denial apparatus. Uh, on that note, although I'm not a fan of military metaphors with respect to climate or the pandemic, uh, I encourage everyone to read Michael Mann's excellent new book, The New Climate War. Uh, next slide, please. Pre-industrial atmospheric CO2 concentrations were steady around 280 parts per million or PPM. Uh, in fact, concentrations had been range constrained as the graph shows roughly between two and 300 PPM for nearly a million years until the post-World War II combustion binge. The current concentration is roughly 415 PPM, which is why it is so urgent that we get to net zero emissions as quickly as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So most of us don't think in gigatons, but from the start of last year, 2020, the remaining carbon budget to stay below two degrees Celsius of heating was less than 600 gigatons. At our current burn rate, we would exceed that budget by the end of 2030. Uh, but unfortunately, even two degrees of heating would be catastrophic. Uh, we've seen the fires, droughts, superstorms, derechos, and all the rest at slightly more than one degree of heating today. Uh, which is why we need to fight to keep the heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius or less. One example of the significance of that half degree drawn from the IPCC's 2018 special report, at 1.5 degrees, we lose 70 to 90 percent of coral reefs. At two degrees, we lose effectively all of them. Uh, there's a very long list of examples like that. Uh, meanwhile, business as usual scenarios have us on pace for at least three to four degrees Celsius of heating. To stay below 1.5 degrees, there is a roughly seven year window at our current burn rate, which again is why we need to reach net zero ASAP. Uh, next slide, please. In a US context, there are five main sources of greenhouse gas emissions, transportation, power generation, industry, buildings, and agriculture. Of the total, perhaps 10% of emissions are from hard to decarbonize sectors like aviation. That means 90% of the emissions are relatively easy to decarbonize given current technologies. 
uh, only political will has been lacking. And so I hope you'll ask yourself how you can contribute to reducing emissions at scale in one or more of these sectors. Next slide, please. Uh, nature is healing was a popular 2020 meme. However, according to a recent Nature Climate Change article, there will be essentially no long-term impact of pandemic-driven emissions reductions on global heating. Uh, next slide, please. However, that same article concludes that a green stimulus approach to pandemic recovery can significantly reduce heating between now and 2050. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, I, I believe Bernie Sanders was trending after the inauguration, largely because although he lost the political battle, he won the war of ideas. So ironically, Joe Biden takes office with the most progressive presidential platform in at least 50 years with climate crisis front and center in his agenda. Uh, in short, we have the technology. There has been a massive shift in popular political, corporate, and financial consensus on the urgency of climate crisis. And as Bill suggested, the arrival of the Biden-Harris administration offers us a once in a civilization opportunity for timely climate action. Additionally, as Bill pointed out, modeling now suggests that locked in heating was being overestimated. So if emissions go to net zero, the heating should largely cease within a couple of decades. Uh, making sure that happens is our work for the next 30 years. Thanks. Tom, that was really terrific. Thank you so much. Um, I think you did a great job to describe a huge issue in a nutshell. So, uh, Laura Wisland, would you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? I will. So, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to connect with fellow scholars and participate on this panel. It's really nice to see everybody virtually. Um, I'm going to use my time to focus on strategies to reduce carbon emissions and uh, identify some ways to get involved. But before I do that, um, actually, can you back, go back to the other slide? Before, you, before I do that, let me share a little bit about the hats, the hats that I've worn so that people know the, per the perspective that I have. And um, if you want to follow up later on some of my experiences, we can do that offline. I'm currently a program officer for the Heising Simons Foundation. And so basically what that means is that I get to help make decisions on how to fund climate and clean energy work being done by uh, nonprofit advocacy organizations and research institutions. And the work that uh, the foundation that I work for funds right now focuses primarily on reducing emissions in the transportation sector, the power sector, and the building sector, primarily in the US at the state and the federal level. So this is just to say that I have some perspective on what it's like to be a funder in this space and the role that philanthropy can play. But really, I've only been in this job for two years. And before this, I spent 11 years working for the Union of Concerned Scientists in Oakland, California, um, where I was working on clean energy, clean electricity policy, and much more directly involved in helping get laws passed and regulations implemented. So I also have some perspective and background in the NGO sector and more deeply in power sector decarbonization strategies. So feel free to follow up with me afterwards. Okay, next slide. So now that Tom has set the stage for really the grave predicament that we're in, I'm going to hopefully lift, lift us up a little bit and talk about some of the strategies. When I think about what we need to do to address the climate crisis, I think about five different pillars. So the first pillar is we need to be using energy more efficiently and we need to be using less energy. And that goes for almost anything you can think of, power appliances, vehicles, buildings, industrial practices, agriculture, you name it. Secondly, we need to systematically shift away from fossil fuel consumption like burning gas in our cars, burning natural gas to heat our buildings and cook our food and towards using electricity as the energy source to power those services. And at the same time, number three, we need to transition that electricity from a fossil-based system that uses coal and natural gas to a carbon-free electricity system because we are gonna need large, large quantities of carbon-free electricity to drive our carbon-free economy going forward. That's critical. Number four, for end uses that can't run on electricity, we're gonna to need to transition to low and zero carbon fuels. And then number five, finally, for greenhouse gases that just can't be avoided, we're gonna to need to capture and permanently sequester that carbon. So the good news is that 
actually keep on that slide. Um, some of these, a lot of these solutions are pretty well advanced and some are just emerging. So the key takeaway for me here is that this is not a technological problem. Like Tom said, a lot of this is political will. This is the challenge is really about bringing these technologies and solutions to scale and making the transition happen fast enough for it to matter for the climate. Okay, now next slide. I also wanna point out that there are many, many different ways to work on climate change. You can go the academic route and do research or teach. You can go into the private sector and work for a company that's making clean energy technologies. You can run for office or work for an elected official and use that power to push for policies that, to address climate. Or you can go work for an NGO that's helping identify and create the support for policymakers to pass the laws and regulations. So the bottom line is that no matter what you're doing, no matter where you live, no matter what your degree is or level of training, you can get involved in this climate fight. Don't think for a minute that you can't address climate change in the job that you have now. Next slide. And then the last thing I want to say is that sometimes when we talk about the climate crisis and we talk about climate action, we get really into the weeds and talk about tons of carbon abated and think about the only thing we need to do is, re is reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and it's not. For me, at least, climate action is about building a safer, healthier, and more equitable world. And our current dependence on fossil fuels that got us into this mess hurts low-income people and people of color worst in this country, and that's no accident. It's because more than a century of structural racism means that if you're Black, if you're Brown, or you're Indigenous in this country, you are more likely to be exposed to fossil fuel pollution and the health impacts of that, and you have less of a safety net to move or rebuild after a climate event like sea level rise or wildfire or a hurricane. So addressing climate change cannot be, under, cannot be done without understanding and addressing how our current energy system has exacerbated inequalities and climate change solutions can not only be about reducing carbon, they have to also advance racial and economic justice. That's it for now. I'm going to pass it on to Mark. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. Well, great to be here and great to see some of the eternally youthful faces of my classmates too. That's a, that's a treat. So the work of my organization is in what might be called social entrepreneurship. And by that, I mean, we, it's asking the question, how can we recruit the markets to help fight climate change? And um, we're gonna now swoop from the larger issues that Laura and Tom and even Bill brought up down to very practical, very on the ground ways to combat climate change. Most of you are probably logging in from cities or towns. And if you are, you live in the midst of an urban forest. And there are now 140 million acres of urban forest in the US. And these are incredibly valuable trees. They store carbon, they reduce stormwater, they clean the air, they reduce urban heat, they save energy, they promote human health, and they can deliver on long delayed promises of environmental justice. And they're all delivered right where 80% of the people live and work. Okay, next slide, please. But there are three big problems. One is tree loss. Uh, we're losing 175,000 acres of trees every year. The, the tree loss since 2009 equals the land area of all of those cities combined. Second big problem, our tree cover is not equitable. And one among many markers of that is that in redlined communities, which as you know, is where discrimination is codified, uh, the average urban heat increase is four degrees, and that rises to 11 degrees in some cities, even surprising ones like Portland, Oregon. Third problem is city budgets don't fund the trees. And that's an accounting issue uh, because elected officials, agency officials love the trees, but trees are booked as an expense and they usually fall below human service needs. We don't as a society or as an accounting practice carry natural capital as an asset on the balance sheet. So all that cities see is an expense. All right, next slide, please. So we, our organization asked, how can we generate much needed, you would say critical funding for this very critical 
environmental climate resilience mitigation asset. The carbon markets have been in place for 30 years. Could we develop a new product, a city forest credit? And then could we take that to market successfully? So uh, it was a daunting proposition um, because we needed to get foundation funding. We're a nonprofit organization. And we needed to do that based on an idea and a plan. We had to recruit all national urban forest stakeholders. We had to get leading scientists because the quantification is critical. We need to develop a protocol drafting group of key people all over the country in all the different sectors relating to urban forestry. Then we needed to develop two complicated long technical carbon protocols. And then we had to get projects going and we had to recruit buyers for this new product. The good news is after a lot of work, we have programs in 16 different cities. Um, we have buyers that range from the city of Austin in Texas, which has a very proactive carbon reduction goal, carbon neutrality goal, in fact. And they have eagerly embraced locally sourced credits because these are taxpayer dollars and they want the dollars and they want the benefits to stay local. But other buyers include Microsoft, Bank of America. Um, another wonderful example is a woman-owned business. Uh, it's a commercial fishing company in Seattle who uh, recently commissioned the first green fishing vessel in the Bering Sea fishery. And they were so excited about it, they wanted to go carbon neutral. Next slide, please. So uh, there's no time to talk about all these many programs. They're all threads in the tapestry that's the urban forest that you all live in, in your own climate zones, your own communities. This project in Richmond uh, was an incredible project. Uh, this was an old African-American cemetery that had essentially been abandoned. The owners could not make it work economically. They had offers to log the property the public cemeteries in Richmond, by the way, are clear cut and are just turf grass. So they're mowed right to the ground. Uh, so a community foundation came in and working with many, many stakeholders, including us, they preserved the cemetery. The trees are now preserved in perpetuity and credited. The credits have been, uh, not all of them, but they are now being purchased by some very well-known companies, um, most of whom are confidential until they announce it. Uh, and the site is now a UNESCO site on the Slave Route project. So it joins Monticello and the UVA campus as the three UNESCO sites in the state of Virginia. But as Laura mentioned, uh, what's wonderful is this is not just about carbon. This is climate action, it's environmental justice, it's community impacts, uh, all in one amazing, incredibly valuable project. Next slide, please. So the best part of all this is you can be a part of this too. So Brendan, why don't you just click through the next slides, just take a couple seconds for each slide. Yeah, you can, good. So you can be a part of the story um, because it's right in your backyard. It's right on your street. It's right in your city. All right, thank you very much. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Megan. Thanks, everybody here. I'm so happy to see some familiar faces, even though it's remote. It's really nice. Um, so my name is Megan. You can go ahead to the next slide, Brendan. Um, at the moment, I think I consider myself a bit of a climate crisis generalist. I've been involved in advocacy both at the university and international levels, and I've done both natural and social science research around climate change. And I'm still learning a lot every day and figuring out where and how I can best contribute. At Carolina, I dug into divestment of fossil fuels and what that actually looks like from the mind of an investor and explored past student efforts toward this goal. I ended up working with a coalition of students across the UNC system to begin to build the institutional knowledge and awareness to pressure UNC management company to divest. And this work often involved meeting with people who were keen to discredit divestment, which could be really discouraging on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And in preparation for this meeting, I said I would discuss burnout briefly. Um, and I've had to pause advocacy for periods of time and have learned that I really have to find my people in the climate world to stay committed. There are many different types of climate groups out there, each with their own culture and some of which I found really toxic for my well-being. So I think my advice would be that it's okay to take a break and it's okay to leave an organization and, and choose a new or different path. Um, and so more recently, I've been working for and now volunteering with an organization known as the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative, or EDGI. Um, we build public platforms that enable communities to access and visualize data about how industrial facilities are abiding by or in violation of pollution permits to better inform advocacy efforts. Um, because at EDGI, we really believe that access to data about your environment is critical to any movement that seeks to address institutional inequality. And I think a consistent lesson that I've learned, which is maybe obvious to many of you, is that the very institutions that have power to take huge steps towards stopping the climate crisis are the very institutions that have helped turn a blind eye to climate destruction for the last 50 years. And that destruction has been incredibly unequal, as both Tom and Laura have mentioned. The Global South is responsible for less than 10% of historic carbon emissions, and yet they're bearing the majority of the negative impacts of climate change. So it seems very clear that our very institutions have to change to equitably tackle the climate crisis, what and who we value has to change. And, you know, I also have to continue to change and question what I know and do. And even looking at the demographics of this panel today, and, and that it is exclusively white, I believe that in order to grow as climate activists, we have to do better and make sure to include underrepresented and misrepresented voices in the climate conversation. Um, and all that's to say is that I think we have a lot of work to do, but there's hope. And I wholeheartedly welcome any current student or alumni support, specifically on the UNC divestment front. Um, so with that, I will pass it off to Steve, unless Mark is back, I'm sure. Steve, take it away. We're um, re reaching out to Mark, so we'll, we'll be back in touch about him. Sure, great. Thanks everybody, it's just wonderful to be with you all today. My theme is collaboration among diverse actors working on the climate crisis. Like others on this call, my intention is to illuminate some different pathways that some of you on this call might consider pursuing if you're not already involved in climate action. I direct the foundation based in Menlo Park, California that has worked in the climate arena for a number of years we are part of a global collaboration of some 50 different funders and many dozens of NGOs working on the particular problem of coal-fired power plants. Coal combustion is responsible for 30% of all CO2 emissions in the world, while coal-fired power generation is in rapid decline in the United States. It's a very different story elsewhere in the world, especially in Asia. In China alone, there are 127 coal plants now in pre-construction. So we face a very big challenge to prevent more coal build out and to hasten the retirement of the existing coal fleet so that we can make room for the emergence of renewable energy. Slide please, Brendan. In our network, we have unified around a goal of ending coal combustion worldwide by the year 2040. This would be a major contribution to achieving the Paris Agreement goal of limiting global heating to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Our theory of change is that success depends on the coordinated efforts of many different actors playing diverse roles. We've got to have campaigners on the ground to organize communities threatened by coal plants. We need lawyers filing lawsuits. We need the World Bank and private lenders to see that it's just plain imprudent to keep financing coal plants, coal mines, and coal infrastructure. We need communications experts to shape a new narrative around renewable energy. We need policy analysts to show public utilities how existing coal plants can be retired with a minimal destruction of capital. Now the optimal mix of these functions varies from country to country. In China, the vast majority of our effort is focused on credible consultative support to the Chinese government, since it's a top-down society and there is very little place for grassroots organizing. 
In Australia, we start with a desecration of Aboriginal lands by coal mines. In Japan, we work with forward-looking companies willing to shame the Japanese government for financing coal plants overseas. In South Korea, we are supporting urban youth who are clamoring for climate action. We're in constant communication with each other on the best way to deploy and shift resources so that when a new threat emerges, say in Bangladesh, we are quickly able to marshal funds and NGO talent to respond. And as this slide illustrates, there is also an important transnational dimension to the work, including support to amplify climate diplomacy, such as side conferences at the annual climate summit. Note again here the variety of approaches described. We badly need activists, but we also need economists who can make the case against coal finance. And ideally, everybody is talking to each other on how best to mix those assets. We've been at work on this project now for about eight years, and we've made very good progress in blunting the expansion of global coal. We're now applying this same framework to other facets of energy sector transformation, such as the necessity to bring about a just transition for the people and communities that have long depended on coal for their economic well being. I hope I've adequately conveyed the different opportunities for engagement that are available to all of us. And I look forward to our discussion in a few moments. We are all ready for questions. Is that right, Steve? Yeah, Bill? Um, would love to have you all uh, chime in. You can just unmute yourself and uh, jump in with a question or feel free to raise your hand physically or with the raise hand feature or just type in the, um, in the chat feed. We love actually having people ask their question on camera because it makes things more interesting and alive. So we'd love for you to just unmute and ask questions. Well, I'll jump in. Um... I've got a question for Laura. Uh, Laura, as we struggle to decarbonize, one of the a really sensitive environmental issue is, can we do it without nuclear? I'm wondering what you think on that issue. Oh, I'm never going to be able to escape the nuclear question. I always <laughs> got it when I was working at UCS. Um, I think that if you look at all the modeling that's been done for our country and globally to figure out how we're going to get to net zero 2050, it is very unlikely that we will be able to do that without nuclear. I think it's a different question about whether we need to go on this whole new nuclear blitz versus keep the existing capacity make sure the existing capacity is operated safely and meeting all the requirements from the NRC and move on from there. So yes, I mean, yes, we can, I think, go do it without nuclear. It will be more expensive because we will be taking offline carbon-free generation and then having to replace that as well as, you know, putting more stuff on. It also will mean more land use because we're gonna to have to be using a lot of land to build out renewables. And that's gonna be one of the limiting factors to figuring out how to generate as much carbon-free electricity as we need. So technically it's possible. It may not get us there as quickly or as cost-effectively as we need to get there. Thanks. Yeah. Great, Ken Smith has a question for you. Can are you able to ask or shall I do it for you? Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Oh, very good. Um, so uh, this isn't for anyone in particular, but you know, I've just been we've just been through an election that was vitally important in the direction of a lot of things. Um, and I think we need to be careful about congratulating ourselves about how much progress we actually made. Uh, so I, I wonder if those most motivated in the climate fight need to consider a different rhetorical approach and think carefully about the labels we throw around and the trigger words that tend to play into the hands of opponents. Um, I mean, for sustained progress, we have to win the median voter. And, I, and by that, I don't mean the moderate voter. I mean the median voter in the places that matter, like North Carolina. Uh, 
Because in my observation, you know, in the 2020 political advertisements in the places that matter, the only ads that were mentioning the Green New Deal were the Republican ads. And I'm just curious if people have thoughts about, uh, you know, we, we, we have to win the hearts and minds of people uh, to, uh, to be effective in all of our scientific ideas about what has to happen. I can jump in on that one since I'm the one who mentioned the Green New Deal. Um, I, I would point out that when it first broke, it was wildly popular across the political spectrum and only after the disinformation machine started worrying on it did the Green New Deal lose popularity on the right in the US. Um, I do think that's probably why Biden chose to say he opposed a Green New Deal and then go forward with an exact Green New Deal policy um, and why that approach will probably be very popular ac across the spectrum in the US. Um, you know, if you look at like the the polling that's done out of the Yale Climate Change Communication Center, for example, uh, most of the core stuff uh, proposed by Green New Deal is, is wildly popular in the US and even relatively popular on the right. So I, I frankly, I agree that like the messaging is the battle and that when you're up against well-funded um, climate denial and climate kind of distraction apparatuses, uh, you know, you're fighting a hard battle. I frankly think we are kind of on the verge of winning for a variety of reasons. Uh, what that victory looks like is I think quite fraught and conflicted as far as, you know, um, how things actually play out. But as far as just the economics of fossil fuel versus the economics of renewables and these kind of generational or like seismic shifts in, in opinion, uh, but I, you know, it's a it's a big struggle. So wel welcome input on on how to reach those people and and how to overcome you know the the Fox News effect, etc. This is Laura. I'll I'll jump in as well. Um, you know, I think with any issue that impacts everybody, there's going to be a big tent of voices, and that is something that provides a lot of opportunity, obviously, and it also provides you know, presents a lot of challenges. How do we keep everybody together to make some change? And I think that Biden and his administration is being pretty straightforward about taking a rhetorical and policy approach that is leading with not only job creation about, you know, what this clean energy transition means in terms of new jobs, but also more squarely addressing where there's going to be some economic hurt in areas that are dependent and you know economies that are dependent on fossil fuels and i think that that's something that is going to be really important for this movement to more squarely address and talk about and come up with solutions because i think once you start talking about about basically see about acknowledging the ways that every single person is impacted by climate change and how different types of people are going to be impacted by the solutions, we will appeal to more people, basically. This is not just about creating, you know, jobs for solar tech people. And I think that we've kind of leaned on that too much in the past. Thank you all. Uh, Andy Barker, class of 91, has a question for the panel. Hi, first of all, thanks to the panelists. Thanks for the work you're all doing and thanks for taking time tonight to talk to us. Um, so I am curious, uh, Tom mentioned that the, the donut framework that looks at uh, sustainability, planetary sustainability boundaries um, is uh, actually has several other sectors where human impacts are, are potentially transgressing these critical boundaries. And uh, so I'm, I'm curious, I'm, I'm asking really a big picture question. Why, why do you feel like climate change is the most urgent issue? I think um, Bill's comment in the beginning was it is the defining issue of our time. Why, why do we frame it that way? And many, all, one other comment is just that many folks mentioned a lot of these climate projects have co-benefits other social, economic, um, and, and environmental co-benefits. Why is it that we don't think of climate impacts as co-benefits to other um, 
uh, you know, other kinds of projects that we're doing. So I'd love to hear some thoughts on that question. Thank you. I, I can weigh in briefly again. Um, I, I would say short answer is that's a great idea. And I do think that's being done and, and more of it should be done as far as the messaging. Um, and, and I think it goes right to Laura's point that, you know, you need to make clear that these are kind of uh, existential and quality of life and bread and butter issues for almost everybody on the planet really at this point. Um, Vis-a-vis -vis the planetary crises, uh, short answer on that is frankly, um, I, I think they're all equally um, significant. Uh, the, I th the risk of uh, passing some sort of tipping point vis-a-vis -vis, like uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, you know heating, et cetera, is probably the most urgent. But as that you know diagram shows, that we're also well beyond the threshold with like nitrogen and phosphorus loading and uh, definitely in a, a precarious position vis-a-vis -vis, you know, mass extinction slash you know, biodiversity loss. So um, all of the, I think these should all be considered uh, coherently. And uh, part of the challenge is the vocabulary around that, figuring out how we talk about it. And part of the challenge, frankly, is that we're talking about problems that are so big and complex and often quite like, you know, technically um, nuanced that, figuring out the ways to get to that language in a way that's accessible and not alienating often is just a really massive battle, right? And so when you say like climate change and then people are like, oh yeah, well, I know it's getting hotter and that means more hurricanes and fires. You're like, great, we got there. The super on my block, I live in New York City, a super on my block the other day goes, yeah, you know, I'm feeling great about the election and, and this climate change, it's gonna mean a lot of jobs. And I was like, wow, there was a massive like climate change communication success that happened if that's the, the progression we're dealing with. Um, but bringing in all those other issues that requires a ton more work. And again, I, I, I hope everybody's uh, up for being part of it, but I don't have an easy answer on it. Thanks, Tom, for that. Uh, Winky Tax class of 86. And I think her puppy, Mo, was <laughs> have a question. Uh, yeah, he was distracting me earlier. So I had to distract him with paper. Um, uh, I, I um, you know, generally sort of understand the need to transition to electricity in the transportation sector, but I do have heartburn about the large number of batteries that creates and I just was curious if anybody had heard any reasonable solutions to that issue. I can I can address that a little bit, but I would actually love to hear from other people. And you know, as someone that's working for the EPA or work for the EPA, I'm glad that you're asking that question. I don't think there's been enough focus on that. Um, you know, after after batteries are past their useful life for EVs, there's still a lot of juice in them. And there's some experiments with how do you stack them and use them for grid level storage. So there's that, but then at the end, you know, end of life for that, I think there are some real materials issues, recycling challenges, toxic wakes challenges that are, we're probably gonna first see with solar panels. And a lot of this does, I think, come down to regulation and sending a strong signal to the companies that are making these technologies that they have to take responsibility for end of life. Um, and I don't think that that signal has been sent. So I think part of this starts with clear, clear signals on you know, what the standard should be in this, in this department. Awesome, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, Mac Harrell. Uh, Morehead Medical Fellow has a question for you all. Thanks, Megan. Um, I have a daughter who is a journalist and lives in Northern California, and I'm particularly interested in what the panelists' uh, thoughts are regarding uh, fire mitigation in the West. Is there anything to this? We've been talking about city forest credits and about how we preserve trees in other environments. What it, what should we be doing in California where there's been massive forest loss? Well, I'll take that. I, I live in, uh, I'm talking to you from Northern New Mexico right now and I'm deep in the heart of the Carson National Forest. I've got forest all around me for about a million acres. All through the West, we've got enormous opportunities 
to do more thinning of the forest. I'm not talking about raking as a certain orange man used to talk about it. Um, but with regard to prepping the forest better, we can do a lot. But that's not enough. Uh, making the forest more resilient, we can do a lot, but that's not enough. Every urban wildlife interface needs to be examined and, uh, and modified, really, to create defensible space uh, so that if there is a, a fire in the forest, it doesn't blow on into the community. In so many of the communities, if you look closely at the after fire photographs, you can actually see that within the community, fires spread from house to house. They weren't being ignited by trees within the community. They were being spread from one porch deck and one roof to another. So just building codes and insurance policies and so forth can have an enormous uh, impact in making these communities less flammable. But what we're facing, the business as usual forecast for the Southwest is for uh, New Mexico, Arizona, parts of Utah and Colorado to be so warm that our trees, our conifer forests are not gonna survive past uh, 2050. That's based on dendrochronological analyses of past forest die-offs and all kinds of stuff like that. So we're really looking at massive ecosystem change throughout the West, even if, even if we contain uh, warming to one and a half or two degrees uh, centigrade. So this is, this is a reworking of the Western landscape that the Western communities have to be deeply, deeply involved in. Uh, I'll just uh, weigh in to say that uh, Bill, Bill's book, uh, Great Aridness, was, uh, you know, it, he basically described everything he just said but 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so he's definitely had his finger on the pulse of this. And um, maybe just circling back, I know at, at some point we'll touch on, you know, climate grief. I'm frankly more focused on climate action because, you know, when the house is on fire, you put it out first and then you deal with your grief. Um, but I get that we all feel it. And so I think that what happened in 2020 is that this became real a little more to most of us or many of us and its consequences in the Amazon and Australia, uh, in Houston, which has had like a 500 year storm like every year for the last five years or something, obviously in California. Um, there's no turning back the clock. We can stop the damage and, and start, you know, slow and then potentially halt future harm. But some of this stuff, we're seeing the consequences of what we've already done. And hopefully that makes us look at it and say, like, we have to act immediately and, and make sure that we don't make this worse than it already is uh, because it's now getting so severe, so. Thanks for that, both of you. Um, I had a question I wanted to kind of um, pop in quickly for Megan and just kind of get the pulse uh, from her and from any maybe current scholars, just what the um, what it's like on campus and how scholars and current students are are addressing uh, these issues. Well, I will say I'm not on campus anymore. Um, it was a it was a weird way to end the time at Carolina virtually. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of shifting in you know, the on campus environmental pulse, so to speak. Um, there's a lot of different types of group that, groups that work on a wide variety of things, um, but more and more we've seen several different types of group pressuring the administration to really um, uphold the promises that they made in UNC's three zeros um, commitment. So back when Carol Folt was um, chancellor, she committed to net zero emissions, waste and water usage by 20, 50, and that originally came with um, a no coal use by 2020. Um, that obviously hasn't happened. Um, and, you know, both on campus with students and outside organizations have like begun to put more and more pressure on South Building to actually address that and, and stay true to that promise. And so I think there's been a lot of success um, in that realm, but it is, you know, it's a constant battle of having to, you know, have constant pressure on the administration to do what they say they're going to do to be honest. 
Wonderful. Uh, next Megan, up. Um, oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. sorry, Megan. Megan, how can people on this call support divestment work at UNC? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in divestment, um, there's a great UNC Divest Twitter that can keep you up to date. Um, if you want to learn more or learn how alumni can be involved, you can shoot me an email. Great. And Kathy Mulvey um, would love for you to ask your question next. Sure. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the for the panel. Um, so there, with a rising tide of of um, lawsuits um, related to climate damages and fraud in, in the U.S. and globally, and I saw that Janet Moss mentioned uh, the great group, Our Children's Trust. I um, was wondering who might speak to the role of US and in international litigation in advancing climate justice and holding responsible parties accountable. Steve, that sounds like you. I'll give it a shot. My assessment of prospects in the US is um, pretty subdued. I'm not optimistic that we see great promises of uh, rulings on these cases. Um, they have progressed in the courts and there has been some uptake, but when you get to the, the courts that matter most, I think we're, we're seeing more setbacks than victories. What I would offer uh, an area that I'm tracking very closely is the emergence of earth jurisprudence, uh, rights of nature. And um, most of the promising developments on this front are occurring beyond our borders. Uh, the Ecuadorian constitution was written, rewritten some years ago to include a provision that provides essentially constitutional protection to natural environments, to rivers, to ecosystems, to marshes. Um, the New Zealand has given legal status to a particular river. There is a tribe in Oklahoma, I'm forgetting its name, that has enshrined the, the rights of uh, the tribal lands to eternal protection. The city of Santa Monica, the city of Pittsburgh, they're, they're all passing um, provisions in their local ordinances that hold out some prospect of really blunting efforts, particularly uh, at, uh, at fossil fuel extraction and the intrusion of pipelines and so forth. Um, again, I think this is, this is still pretty much below the radar, uh, but in this regard, and I, but there, there, there are serious uh, legal scholars in the United States who are beginning to hold up these ideas as a body of jurisprudence uh, that could, could have some real prospect. Um, the question is, can we, get the job done of enshrining these principles soon enough so that they become real bulwarks in uh, asserting claims. Um, and we'll have to see on that. I wouldn't give up the ship. I love our children's trust. I, I love the fact that the, the New York State Attorney General tried to take ExxonMobil to task for misleading uh, the world about the, the harms from its behavior. Um, but I, I'm at this, and I maybe there are others who are more optimistic than I'd love to hear from you if there are those on the call. Well, because Kathy won't do it herself, I'll just give a plug that she is an expert in this area and the work that she's done at UCS has really raised his profile. And, you know, I'll say that even though the chances are probably not great that, that those lawsuits are going to succeed, I think there's real value in, in helping put pressure and focus on the role of the fossil fuel industry in the amount of carbon that is associated with their activity and, and the types of things that they understood way before the general public did and the actions that they took. So I think that it does help provide some pressure and some accountability, even if those lawsuits don't, don't you know, ultimately succeed. Ironically, I almost think, and I mean, it's characteristic of our system, but that um, lawsuits that are accusing companies of uh, securities fraud coming from shareholders are maybe more likely to get traction, just again, because of how our system works. I think there's actually a Supreme Court case right now, um, uh, our, some pension fund in Arkansas suing Goldman Sachs over stuff related to CDOs from the financial crisis. Uh, but that would bear on this where like if you could go back and say Exxon kind of lied to us 
as shareholders in there, right? Then, um, but it's, you know, a total toss up. Uh, no, panel, uh, oh, man, uh, is another question? Well, okay. no, this is Mark. Um, oh, Mark, hey. I just might mention that, you know, Kathy, your work and the, the and what Steve referred to in the legal area is that re retooling of some of our institutional structures. And I had just mentioned in my quick presentation how trees are not carried as natural capital. There is a movement, you know, to um, incorporate natural capital into uh, governmental budgets, into national, state, county, city budgets, so that it's not just financial capital that matters, because financial capital has expanded, and now we talk about human capital and social capital. Natural capital should be in the metric for all of those entities. Ideally, it should be in the metric for all, all, all private sector companies, too. So we're, I think we're seeing analogous efforts like that to try to reshape institutions to address some of these problems. Kathy, given that you have expertise on this, can, can you weigh in with your own thoughts or? I mean, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question about um, what winning means. And, and um, you know, Tom, your, I think the point of, um, you know, prod to their own own shareholders is, is certainly one as we as we're seeing companies debook assets. Um, but you know if we look at at the history of other other industries that have been held to account like the tobacco industry, um, the the question of sort of the, a tipping point with their social license um, in in terms of um, you know, society really being able to create the political will to overcome their opposition. Um, I, you know, the, the litigation, I think, is one important tool in that toolbox, and it absolutely needs to happen in a, in a context of, um, a, a, you know, broader context of public campaigning and informed by science and, you know, with, an, with a range of, of ingredients um, to, be, to be part of the part of a, a comprehensive solution. Wonderful, thank you. That's great. Our, our attendees uh, really adding color and lots of depth. Thank you so much for that, Kathy. Um, question from Donna Gooden Payne for the panelists. What books or other publications would you recommend we read to learn more about climate change solutions at a global level? I'm not finished reading it yet, but I would recommend All We Can Save. Um, it's a relatively new book. And I think it, the author's names, I can see their faces are slipping my mind at the moment. I'm sure others know. Um, but I think it paints a really good picture of the degree of crisis we're in, but also offers a lot of opportunity for, for hope and, and imagining what is possible if we really commit to it in the next 10 years. Um, so I would recommend that book. I don't have much of a suggestion about um, anything that would survey solutions, which is something we need. But I can show you a book that, if you just want to scare the scare the dickens out of yourself, uh, you can look at this one. Um, and I particularly recommend not particular not this book so much as the review of it that Bill McKibben wrote in the New York Review of Books about six months ago. Um, a very, very good summary of what we're facing and how urgent the work that we need to address is. I confess that I actually haven't read this book, but it's been sitting by my bed for a while. It's, uh, it's Drawdown, the compilation of, of case studies uh, all aimed at pulling carbon out of the atmosphere uh, with a, just a multiplicity of approaches. Uh, soil carbon sequestration, for example. Uh, Paul Hawken, uh, who's a wonderful writer, uh, I recommend many of his, his previous books. Um, pr probably worth a look, but I'm sorry that I can't speak authoritatively, not ha having read it myself. 
I think we have to mention Bill DeBuis, the author here moderating for us as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Bill, tell us about the book you would recommend of your own, which you're too humble to mention if we didn't call you out. <laughs> You're very kind, Kim, but there goes the neighborhood, you know. <laughs> uh, um, so my book is called A Great Aridness, uh, Climate Change in the Future of the American Southwest. And it it's now 10 years old. Um, and um, alas, the predictions in it are all coming true. It would be nice to be wrong about some of those things, but um, that book is is still out there. Wonderful, thanks. And, and if others think of, of uh, books or articles and want to post them in the chat, that would be great. Aubrey, will you ask your question next? Sure, hi everyone. Thanks so much for um, this amazing dialogue. Um, so I work for the city of Baltimore as a climate resilience planner in public sector, which is per my comment <laughs> earlier of why we need more people in public sector to fight for climate change from the inside out, even though I'm not an elected official. Um, but anyway, so my comment um, and question kind of extend beyond, you know, kind of the, I know we've touched on this in many ways, including um, Tom's presentation, touching on the Green New Deal and everything, but the holistic approach really to, um, to climate action, including, you know, not only the greenhouse gas emissions reduction piece um, and uh, the decarbonization strategies that you all talked about, but I was wondering if you could comment more on your interactions with kind of the adaptation hazard mitigation um, and kind of community resilience building side of things. I just think like sometimes it tends to be missing from the broader conversation, um, kind of the social considerations um, that need to happen kind of at the local level within cities, but cities aren't seeing enough support from other levels of government. Um, hopefully things change under this new administration, but there's kind of been, while um, Biden and Harris's administration has been kind of talking about this broader um, climate action strategy at the federal level, there's a lot of, you know, kind of among hazard mitigation people and emergency managers, um, this broader push for or need for basically reform um, and more funding to support mitigation activities, um, you know, reducing the impacts of climate change that are actually seeing here and now on the ground in communities, particularly low income communities of color and urban areas um, that aren't able to really have access to the resources to prepare for, um, you know, events that could happen at any given point in time in cities, um, including extreme heat, uh, and kind of the housing stock that we're seeing in um, urban areas. You know, I live in Baltimore. There's still housing um, here that doesn't even have air conditioning, let alone a window air conditioning unit. Um, and, you know, someone lives in a row home that's surrounded by vacant row homes. They're completely insulated um, in the summer times. And, you know, heat can get up to almost 20 degrees hotter inside a row home without air conditioning um, compared to other areas of the city. So these, um, inequities are extremely devastating and um, far reaching and vast. And I think sometimes gets left out of the conversation as to you know the direct impacts that we're seeing um, in communities on the ground. So anyways, long winded, but just giving some context for my um, passion about this area. And I would just love to hear um, you, know, you guys talk more about your interaction and thoughts around what's needed um, in this arena to complement the decarbonization strategies that you guys talked about. Uh, if nobody else wants to jump in on that, I can touch on it briefly. Um, one one piece of my work is uh, with I just like volunteer work, frankly, but um, with some grassroots orgs in New York City and New York State, um, New York Communities for Change at the city level, New York Renews, which is a, a big umbrella um, coalition at the state level. Uh, but they're doing the exact sort of uh, building that I think that it sounds like you both are involved with and, and supporting. Um, New York Communities for Change in particular has been remarkably effective at, at building like multiracial grassroots coalitions around the kind of combination of uh, built environment issues, environmental hazards, uh, you know, environmental racism. So siting of power plants, waste transfer stations, uh, you know, major trucking transit uh, shipment, you know, facilities, et cetera, in New York. Uh, and then tying that to a kind of Green New Deal style um, energy transition with, you know, attention paid to uh, 
um, you know, just transition for fossil fuel workers, other folks affected, and then, you know, trying to create a bunch of great new jobs as we close down those fracked gas peaker plants that, you know, have been, um, you know, built out in New York City or transitioned over the last couple of decades. So um, New York Communities for Change is that organization. Uh, we Act is another one in New York. Obviously, there's a ton of them, but um, it's been really cool in the last couple of years to see New York uh, kind of wake from its slumber on this stuff and um, pass a whole, you know, raft of, of really uh, important legislation. And so now the battle is to make sure that um, we actually get political follow through as opposed to just uh, the rhetoric. Um, I think we're almost out of time, but I'll add briefly um, just a little bit of a plug for the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative. I think we have a really great coalition of folks in a lot of different communities that are exactly working on this issue. And I think a big part of starting to address it is having the data to do so. Um, and a great piece of legislation, in my opinion, I don't think it's going to make it to the House, uh, that was just introduced by Cori Bush and Ed Markey is the Environmental Justice Mapping Act. Um, and a lot of it is about getting the data that we need to, to adequately address those problems and help communities. And I might just throw in real quickly, uh, Aubrey, I second all of your emotions, totally. Um, we've been working since our inception on this issue of environmental justice. Um, because as I said, you know, their tree equity is not present in urban areas. So there is, there is a lot of work going on in that area. Um, American Forests in Washington, DC, they've developed, or they are in development on a tree equity sort of mapping system so that they can identify areas where the canopy is low and that are under-resourced areas. We have been working really hard to, to take that concept of an under-resourced area and trees and environmental justice and try to decide, determine, well, what exactly does equity, does tree equity mean in the context of that neighborhood? Because all too often there's a little bit of the white savior idea that if we just go plant trees in an under-resourced neighborhood, we've achieved equity. It's much more complicated than that. Um, understanding the context of the community, engaging the local community in the design of a project and the implementation, being aware of soils issues, water issues, uh, bioremediation issues, sharing the economic equity that is delivered when you have projects in cities. These are all really important issues. Um, and the funding is just, the funding is a chronic problem. Um, and I, I vowed I wouldn't get too negative or too discouraging, but um, this is a problem. And we encountered actually in some of the huge tree planting initiatives. So you've heard about trillion trees and one tree planted and all these because they're all, they, their pitch to the companies is all, give us a dollar, we'll plant a tree. Well, you cannot plant and maintain a tree in a city for a dollar. And if the, if the only lens on, on environmental justice or on trees is carbon reduction, well, then they're gonna do the big reforestation projects, which are fine and they should do that, but they're, they're not even gonna see these environmental justice projects where you're really investing in a landscape and a community, not just in carbon storage. So there are a lot of us fighting that battle, but it's, to be honest, it's slow. And, and you know, you've just testified to that. Thank you, Mark. I just think there's so much more on the energy efficiency uh, front, weatherizing, building weatherization, um, you know, complemented with the natural uh, systems approach, you know, with trees and everything that you were mentioning. Um, it's just, you know, so the, yeah, pre-disaster mitigation side of things is just so lacking as a whole, you know, we always, the, the trend is just to wait, you know, till something happens to then react and, and figure out, you know, maybe how not to let it impact communities that bad, again, you know, with New York, Hurricane Sandy, um, you know, that that's just kind of brought that framing. Um, but there's a lot of cities and other communities that haven't had such a severe natural disaster yet that has, you know, initiated this kind of thinking. And so sometimes it feels like such a tough battle um, to make it seem like, you know, it is a huge priority and needs to be kind of a part of the conversation always, regardless of whether or not a major disaster has already occurred. Um, so it's just, yeah, it, thank you for your comments. I feel like it's uh, important to continue this dialogue, so. 
And thanks for great questions and comments, Aubrey. That's wonderful. Um, Lily Zay, we'd love for you to, to wrap us up with our Q&A and comments. Hey, everyone. Um, I was going to ask about uh, climate grief because I know that was an end post we kind of set for ourselves, but I'm really reluctant to bring the energy down because I'm so heartened to have this community. Um, just a few months ago, I reached out to Chuck and Kim and David Greer, and they were so helpful in introducing me to many of you um, who are familiar in name only, but I'm so glad that we've convened to be together. And I did wanna um, briefly ask about climate grief and the kind of um, despair or hopelessness <laughs> for lack of gentler words that many of us might experience. Um, I myself feel overcome by these emotions almost on a daily basis as a young person, um, feeling the enormity of this on my shoulders. And so it does feel really good to be reminded by your faces that I'm not alone. It's not on any single one of us. And I'm grateful that our conversation has focused on the powers that be in holding them to account rather than thinking of whether we can take fewer showers or eat fewer hamburgers, because frankly, I find those um, conversations really uninteresting this many years into the climate emergency. Um, but I wondered if we might share some words of encouragement with one another, or if any of you have strategies for buoying yourselves against this um, crisis, which is inevitably heavy and hard to deal with. Thank you. Hey, Lily. Um, good to see you here. I am going to plug a song quickly. I'll put it in the chat. But it's basically um, some background music to a speech that Greta Thunberg gave. Um, and I always listen to it pretty much every day, to be honest. Um, so I don't have any like overarching feedback other than that the song is great. So I'm going to put it in the chat. Hi, Lily. This is Bill DeBuis. I, I uh, appreciate your question. It's one that I wrestle with all the time. And uh, uh, the answer is a big one. If there is an answer, uh, I'll just give a little piece of what I think has been useful to me. And that is I, 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 I try to uh, draw strength from a metaphor. I, I uh, have spent some time traveling um, in uh, remote places with medical expeditions. And when I'm really uh, feeling up against the wall, I try to imagine myself as a doctor administering, uh, trying to help people with their health in sort of uh, deprived conditions where you don't have a lot of a lot of tools at your disposal, no x-rays, no blood work, no nothing. All you can do really is emphasize care over cure. And I've watched medical people operate in these conditions over and over. I'm in awe of them. And so when I get stuck, I just think every situation, a clinic. And I try to imagine myself in a clinic handling how tough things are. And the next thing that I try to do is just to remember to give myself a break and get out and absorb the beauty of the world. That's, uh, that's where I get uh, renewal. Wonderful, thank you for that. Uh, we are, are up against our, our time. And I, I wanted to take just a quick moment to bring up the idea of forming a climate action affinity group on the MC network. As you know, we already have affinity groups for several of our um, identity groups and several of our um, sort of uh, just general interest and career groups. We thought this would be uh, a good one. And we're working currently with the members of this panel to identify the mission of the group and get it all set up for you to join if you'd like. So. Once the group is all set up, we're going to take the liberty of sending an invitation to anyone who attended this call uh, with a link to the MCN group and instructions for finding um, the join button and clicking and uh, 
it'll, I think it'll just give you a nice space on the MC network where you can have continue the conversation and uh, plan future events like this. Uh, in addition to inviting this group directly, we'll also advertise uh, the existence of the group in our, in our next newsletter, our next couple of newsletters. So folks who weren't able to join um, the call tonight would still be able to join the group. Um, so Bill, if you would share some closing thoughts for the group, that would be wonderful. Uh, I'm very happy to, and, and thank you everybody for participating. This was a terrific conversation and special thanks to the panelists, but really to everyone and such good questions, such thoughtful comments, really appreciate it all. Um, I'm a storyteller and so I'll tell a very quick story. I attended a talk that uh, Bill McKibben gave. This is a long time ago now. And after the talk, Bill came down from the uh, uh, rostrum from the lectern, whatever, and, and just mingled with people in the auditorium. And a lady asked him, OK, well, you've convinced me that climate change is real and that I really need to engage with this. But how do I prepare for it? And Bill, who was never at a loss for words, shot back live in a strong community. And the lady thought about that for a nanosecond and then asked the logical follow-up question. She asked, well, how do I find a strong community? And Bill shot back again. He said, you don't find it, you build it. And what I'm taking away from our discussion and really from work and climate change is is that that's, that's a good, good answer, but it's partial. What we are learning more and more is that climate, the issue of climate change is like a, a vast forest, a big ecosystem. Everything is connected to everything else. Social equity is in there. Racial justice is in there. Um, economic and environmental justice uh, are in there as well. Everything's connected to everything else. As Naomi Klein, I saw it go by in the chat, somebody mentioned, and thank you for doing this, Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything. That's why climate change is the defining issue of our time, because it cuts through to every aspect of our social structure, our economic life, all the way to our international relations, and the world community, the character of it. And so Bill's right, the way to deal with this thing is to build a strong community, but it's also to work at scale, to build a strong society at a national level, to build, to work for international justice. Everything is connected here. And this is in a way the blessing of climate change work because every part of it is so profoundly meaningful. If you work on climate change, you don't have to wonder if there is real meaning in life. You're connected to it just as though you put your finger in an electric outlet. <laughs> you can't escape it. The meaning, the work, the connection at every level, this is what we need to do. This is our work. Let's go do it. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Bill, and all of our panelists. We just had an amazing time spending an evening together and talking about such an important issue. Thank you again um, for being here.